Okay, so we'll get started. Um, I'll just quickly introduce myself, then I'll hand it over to Jason. Um, my name is Rachel Cruz, and I am a poet and writer, and I am a fellow organizer of the Digital Sala, which is a virtual um, Philippinex uh, literary festival that's happening this month in April. And um, I'm excited to have Dean Alfar and Nikki Alfar today. Um, we are going to have a conversation with um, them as Philippinex um, speculative writers. Um, so before we we um, chat with you both, I'm going to hand it over to Jason. Hello. Uh, thank you for, for taking some time, uh, time aside, Dean and Nikki, for uh, uh, participating in this conversation. I want to shout out Alden, who also helped um, uh, put this together. Um, Rachel, I think you made us also co-hosts for this Zoom. I'm getting, I'm just admitting people as they're, they're coming through. So uh, I just want to talk about the digital sala real quick. I'm just going to kind of read something that I, uh, just to kind of intro um, kind of the context for which is, this is all going on. I'm, I'm uh, based here in um, Kumeyaay land, which is also known as um, San Diego, California, right? And so I just want to talk a little bit about the digital sala, and then I'll, I'll pass it back to uh, to Rachel. So um, the digital sala is, as, as Rachel said, a, a virtual Philippinex literary festival happening on various platforms throughout April 2020. I think so far, the things that we have been doing have mostly been happening on Zoom, uh, but I, I imagine some folks are going to use other platforms like So the Digital Sala is a collaborative, decentralized, and grassroots effort, um, but it's also supported by uh, the following, at, at present, uh, the following institutions and organizations. Um, ethnic, the Ethnic Studies Program at Cal State San Marco, California State University San Marcos, uh, the Ethnic Studies Department at the University of San Diego, uh, the Bolosan Center for Filipino Studies at University of California Davis, Archipelago Books in San Francisco, California, Eastwind Books in Berkeley, California, um, the online literary magazine Marias at Santa Gitas, um, and this Filipino American Life podcast. Um, uh, just some more notes. Uh, the digital sala is a radically flexible, building as we go along, open ended collaborative festival. Thus far, we have hosted a strategy session. Uh, some of the things that we've hosted in, in these first week and a half have been a strategy, strategy session for a solidarity project among writers and workers. Um, we've supported and publicized open mics, workshops, and other aligned events happening in our communities. Um, and we're looking forward to hosting readings and conversations such as this one uh, with Dean and Nikki on Philippine X Speculative Writing, um, a fun and casual pop cultural hour with Rachel Cruz and Michelle Pendeloza, which is happening on Friday. Um, a book conversation on poet Barbara Jane Reyes's latest uh, book, Letters to a Young, her forthcoming book, Letters to a Young Brown Girl, um, and other uh, various forms of gatherings. Uh, the digital sala, and I want to emphasize this, the digital sala leaves the door wide open for your ideas, and we invite you to show up, gather, co-build, co-create, and hold space for our communities. Ultimately, we're all here to show up and support one another, we plan to archive these experiences and as, as we build resources toward future initiatives and collaborations. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We don't have a website yet. We're talking about it maybe just to have a, a, another central hub, uh, but we're, all of our handles on, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook are at uh, the digital sala. Right? So I'll pass it back to Rachel, but that's kind of the context of this effort and in, in, um, it's building and building as we're moving along. Well, thank you, Jason. I actually want to um, have Alden introduce himself since he helped to co-organize this event. Hey, everyone. My name is uh, Alden Murdy Wood. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of English at Wright U Rice University in Houston. Uh, and I'm a big fan of both um, Nikki and Dean's work. So I'm really excited that we're having this conversation. Um, so let's do it. Um, awesome. Thank you. And um, I have a lot of gratitude for Dean and Nikki um, for, for you both being here today. And um, I just wanted to shout out um, Dean's introduction to Quinto Lost Things, which is an anthology of new Philippine myths. Um, he was able to write um, the introduction to the anthology that Liz Sipin Gabon and I were working on a couple years back. 
And, um, and it was a huge honor to, um, you know, have your words uh, preface that anthology. And um, we're, we're all excited for you both to be here. And I'm going to read um, an abbreviated version of your bios. And then if you have something to read. <laughs> And then if folks want to do, uh, if they have questions, I know there's some, a couple people had some questions over Twitter, so I have the, their questions, but um, we have about 22 people here. And if you have questions um, for Dean or Nikki or both, you can put them in the chat. Um, but Dean Francis Alfar is an, a leading advocate of speculative fiction in the Philippines and the publisher of the annual Philippine Speculative Fiction Anthology. His novel, his novel, Salamanca, won both the Book Development Association of the Philippines Gintong Aklat Award, as well as the Grand Prize in the Don Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards for Literature. Um, he's won several awards, um, and his short fiction has been collected in The Kite of the Stars and Other Stories, and has been published in venues both national and international, including The Year's Best Fantasy and Horror, Rabid Transit, Menagerie, Latitude, and the Apex Book of World SF. And Nikki Alfar has, I really love this bio, Nikki, um, has fought fire 7,000 feet in midair and killed a snake with a flip flop. I, I kind of want to hear more about that later. <laughs> um, confoundingly, she's found it much harder to earn a few Don Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards for Literature, a couple of Bewildering Stories Mariners Awards, a Manila Critics Circle National Book Award, and selection as one of 12 Filipino writers of note by the Ateneo Library of Women's Writings. Nevertheless, she perseveres, somehow getting fiction published nationally and internationally, including her short story collection, Now, Then, and Elsewhere. She's a proud founding member of the Lit Critters group Writing Group, has been a fellow at the UP National Writers Workshop, as well as a judge for the Palanca and Philippines Free Press Literary Awards, um, among many other awards and publications. Um, welcome to you both. We're, we're all glad that you're here. Thank you for having us. <laughs> would you like to start with reading something or would you like to launch into more conversation? This is really just sort of, we're, we're all open to seeing how this evolves. Okay, we actually prepared a reading each, but we decided just now to introduce a younger Alfar, who is also an author and a writer, and she will read from Nikki's work. So ladies and gentlemen, Sage Alfar. My reader. <laughs> Hello, that's me. Hi, I'm Sage Alfar. I'm uh, the first oh, Alfar. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm also a writer. Uh, Dad and I worked on a book together uh, called uh, Stars and Jars, Strange and Fantastic Stories. So that's something. I'm going to be reading from uh, Nikki Alfar, my mom's work today. Uh, it's a piece called Bearing Fruit. So I'll go ahead and start on that. <clears throat> Bearing Fruit by Nikki Alfar. This, of course, is what comes of being overly friendly with strange mangoes. One day you're a wide-eyed virgin with nary a care in the world. The next, you find yourself most unexpectedly and all but inexplicably burdened in a manner that affect, afflicts virgins only once every 2,000 years or so, to the best of your understanding. It isn't fair, but folk tales rarely are to young maidens. This is the first thing that you really ought to know. Once upon a time, we might as well put it that way, why not? You are bathing, innocently enough, in the bend of the river closest to your home, when bobbing along with the current out of apparent nowhere. What an outstanding introduction. <laughs> comes the smoothest, ripest, most glowingly golden mango anyone has ever seen. Charmed, you try to catch hold of it, but it slyly eludes your grasp, slipping through your fingers like the very water you are immersed in, ducking and dodging and diving beneath the ripple glass surface, until you can barely make it out as a hectic vividness against the clear green of the river, the clear brown of your skin. <clears throat> then it is nudging against you, tickling and taunting and teasing with its stem, that very spot on your body that you yourself do not touch unless cleanliness demands it, or, it must be said, unless your own urges demand it. Somehow harder, longer, and really quite a good deal more insolent than any other stem of any other mango in your admittedly limited experience. You hold still, unable or perhaps unwilling to move, speechless and trembling, and not from the cool of the waters. 
Soon your girl cousins are laughing, having noticed, if not precisely understood, what is going on, screamy, titillated girl giggles. And really, who can help but laugh at the sight of your boy cousins, popping up like rabbits along the riverbank, demanding to know, in their manliest tones, what is happening, while still ostentatiously keeping their backs turned to the forbidden sight of your collective cousinly nudity. Yes, you are laughing too, breathless with amusement and breathless with more than that. Then the impudent mango floats up into your hands just as obligingly and ordinarily as any other fruit, although you have never actually encountered another fox of floating fruit before. And you tell the boys that, yes, everything is fine. No, there's nothing to worry about. Maybe it was only a fish, but thank you for standing such solicitous guard. You tuck the mango between your breasts. Well, you are naked. Where else is there to put it except where he's already been? And you are certainly not ready to go through that again. And hurriedly get dressed, donning underclothes, skirt, blouse, wringing your hair as best as you can before piling the drenched length of it atop your head for the walk home. Only now the mango Open, looks pay attention. <laughs> Only now the mango looks peculiar under your blouse, as if you had suddenly sprouted a third, somewhat misshapen breast. Mm -hmm. So you wind it up in the twist of your skirt and decide to postpone its consumption until the brink of spoilage, preserving your fruit friend as a reminder of shared laughter and private pleasure. By the next morning, the mango has precipitously gone to seed, and the equally precipitous bulge of your previously flat belly makes it difficult to imagine that you are anything other than abruptly pregnant. For probably you should have known better than to take the fruit home both literally and figuratively, which makes this the second thing you ought to have known. And that's the excerpt. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sage. That was awesome. So that, that was Bearing Fruit from Nikki's first collection, Now Then and Else When. Yes. And uh, she has more stories. She has a second collection. Yes, I do. Uh, Wonderlust, and it also won a National Book Award, so I'm pretty pleased. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Great. And I think um, we are going to get into questions, unless you have anything else to read or want to share with us. No, let's just maximize our time because unless this is the professional Zoom, it dies after 40 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Luckily, this is professional Zoom. Oh, um, good someone's... for you. Yeah. <laughs> We're too cheap to pay for it. <laughs> well, I'm I'm lucky. My the school where I teach, they're they've given us professional access, so I'm wow, okay. using it for nefarious purposes. Oh. <laughs> Um, someone is asking in the chat about the snake that you killed with the flip-flop. Oh, um, let's see, I was, I think I was in college at the time and my mom called me into our bathroom to kill a worm. So I got on my knees and I pounded at this worm and I, it took a long time to kill the damn thing. It was only when I was walking out that my vet friend said, hey, where'd you get the snake? I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> was it, was it real? It was real. It was a real snake, apparently. It I'm holding the snake right now. Not a person. <laughs> this is why she and I are speculative fiction writers, because life is strange, especially yeah. over here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, did that story, um, did it inspire any other speculative stories? Not so far, but it's definitely something I might put in somewhere in the future. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the the project of the anthologies, the spe Philippine speculative fiction anthologies. And I know, Nikki, your work is um, in, you know, there have been collaborations between you two in terms of editing and, and founding those anthologies. Um, and it seems to me that there's such a community oriented approach um, to those anthologies. And um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process. I know it's, it's been a couple years since since you started it. And I'd, I'd like to hear where, where those anthologies are now. Sure. The couple of years is actually 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> As in our reader was three when it started. Yes. <laughs> so uh, the way it actually began was uh, I grew up reading a lot of fantasy and uh, I, I just loved it, but it was very difficult to find uh, well-written fantasy stories of the type that I really like here locally in the Philippines. So I, I needed to go outside to be able to, to find the stories that I like to read. 
ultimately that uh, made me consider writing stories on my own. And then next step would be uh, encouraging other Filipino authors to, to write stories. Simply because I, I really felt that we could. I, I, I saw no reason why way to encourage the writing of the kind of stories that, that I wanted to see. Because uh, while there were a lot of books being published here in the Philippines during that time, very, very few of them were of the nature that I liked. So uh, I put together some money and uh, funded the first volume of Philippine speculative fiction and put it out, put out a call for submissions. And I was uh, deeply... We might have some Zoom bombers on here, actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, we will be kicking part... people out. <laughs> sure. it's, it's part of the new normal. Yeah. So anyway, I was very surprised by the response. Uh, the first volume alone, we got uh, around 200 or so uh, submissions from all over the country and different parts of the world from uh, writers from the Philippines or with ancestry derived from the, the Philippines and it became a matter of, of selecting uh, the stories so our first volume came out in uh, 2005 and then I repeated it next year the following year 2006 the following year I realized that I had the best resource. I was actually <laughs> sleeping with the best resource, my, my favorite editor. And uh, since then, we worked together. And uh, eventually, we started inviting other people to co-edit with us or turning over discrete volumes for other people to, to edit. That way, uh, it's not just us who are gatekeeping because it's I, not our vision it's, it's not our vision I, I i really hate that because you are right uh, i i believe in a community approach so it isn't just my aesthetics or nikki's or our aesthetics uh, even though nikki is always right <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was important for us to find ways to encourage uh, the different kinds of voices Although, of course, our, our anthology is in English, it was always our dream to have the anthology uh, in the different languages of the archipelago. Uh, mm. so, so that's it. So since then, we funded it by, by ourselves. Uh, we came out with print uh, editions, and then later we shifted to digital, and uh, we moved on from there. Uh, sadly, we ran into a snag uh, the past uh, this last anthology uh, edition has has not been published yet because our favorite partner uh, closed shop so mm -hmm. we are still looking for ways to get the latest volume out but the response has been amazing uh, because of the anthology uh, speculative fiction was eventually recognized as part of curriculum in, in colleges mm -hmm. uh, uh, certain stories were added uh, in textbooks for high school as well as yes <laughs> so it's, it's 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 wonderful and we are so happy to have been a part of it because it's still growing stronger absolutely nikki did you want to add to that at all i just some people have called speculative fiction the most important movement in filipino literature in recent years which we don't say, but that's kind of cool to hear. <laughs> I think the move. I think that the move to um, digital is is really wonderful, and I and I've received the benefits of that as someone who lives in California, in the United States, is just having access to the digital versions of um, Philippine speculative fiction anthologies, because I know purchasing books from the Philippines is so expensive, and getting you know on top of shipping costs and all that, and um, you know, and so it's been really incredible to have access to those digital versions. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of, um, and that's what we're trying to do too, as the digital sala is like increased accessibility of, um, you know, of, of Filipino texts and, and storytelling and being able to find these ways where we can connect with each other. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that move, that shift to digital and um, if there's anything, I know the press is no longer um, operating, but maybe are you envisioning other ways where you can see these stories circulating? Yes. 
So, uh, as I said, until volume six, we were running print. And I'm so old school and old fashioned that I really love that because a book is a book is a book. You, it's tactile, <laughs> you hold it, you open it, you smell it, you can sleep on it, yeah, carry it a around. A lot of our authors get published for the first time in our anthology. Yes. It's and, a big deal to them to mm, be able to hold it. Yes, because, and you can take pictures with it. So. And you know, show it to mom. Show it. <laughs> Yay! We're back. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Okay. That's okay. No problem. <laughs> okay, <think>. we're. <laughs> oh, we were talking about um, the move to digital and you envisioning what where that uh, where the next oh, anthology yeah. would be. Yeah. Yes. So we really love the print format, right? but it really costs a lot. And after six or seven years of out-of-pocket expenses, it was really time for us to explore uh, a less expensive mode. And also, finally, just embrace digital. Mm. So we did just that. Uh, we partnered with Flipside Publishing, and they were able to help us uh, come out with EPUB and Mobi versions of the anthology series. Uh, going backwards and then publishing everything we had published up to that time and then moving forward and indeed that gave us more uh, readers and, and more access because more we reach. more reach we were available on various uh, platforms uh, Apple the Apple Store uh, Amazon and uh, other places so it really is the the now. I was about to say it's the future, but it's it's the now. Mm -hmm. And if only uh, we didn't need to think of the business side of it, the costs, I would give out all these stories for free. And in essence, that is the spirit of what we were doing much earlier when we were just paying out of pocket for all the costs of publication and we were paying our authors as well for the rights to publish their story. Any income that we made was rolled over for the publication of the next year's mm. book. Yeah. So in today's... She said to me at one point, do the kids really need to go to school? <laughs> <laughs> you could homeschool, right? <laughs> so now uh, there are so many ways of, of sharing. Uh, just as a throwback, when I used to have a blog, I would publish stories there and, and share uh, on Facebook via notes. We can also do that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's so easy now to put up a website and just publish for free. And yet, a part of me still wants it to be a book mm -hmm. of some sort. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I think, Alden, you had a question. Yeah, so I just, it was a, it's a follow up question to, to what you both were saying about um, the. The initial the initial Kestrel publications and collections being the sort of like labor of love um, that you're you're doing for on behalf of, of the sort of writerly community that like you've you've generated and created, um, but then you have um, the in 2013 you have the publication of like the the best of um, collection like 2005 to 2010 right, um, which is published by UP Press right. And so, you know, I mean, don't you don't I'm, I guess I am kind of asking for a little bit of cheese miss if you can, but like, you know, I'm always one. I'm always like wondered. Um, I'm, I'm always like interested in in, in hearing about, uh, you know, literary gatekeeping, right, the sort of practice of literary gatekeeping and then recognizing a kind of trend that's emerging and coming up and people are doing the really hard work of, of making making this particular kind of movement take off. And then it's kind of recognized as like, oh, this is something that's legible within academia, within university like um, publishing. So I'm just like wondering like what those kinds of conversations were like to transition from like um, collection number one, right? You doing the work that you just described doing to having that conversation to release the best of the 10, uh, the, the 10 years um, with UP Press. And like, what was that like? And like, what were those conversations with editors like? Were they were they just realizing, hey, this is something that we have to pay attention to and, and give it a home within like an academic publishing press? So just a little bit more about like those kinds of conversations and how they happened. UP Press is pretty progressive, and uh, we love them because even before they they took on uh, the best of Philippine speculative fiction, 
there were already conversations going on about coming up with projects that would uh, highlight the elements of spec of spec fic. And in fact, we were able to create for them uh, a, a new series of anthologies, uh, Filipino fantasy for young adults. So we came out with a volume for fantasy, pure fantasy. We came up with one for science fiction. We came up with one for horror. And uh, we are in the process of putting together a volume for alternate history. So it's me and Kenneth Yu who are coming up with these. And our target audience are the young adults. And it's a whole new slew of stories and, and writers. Uh, the Philippine speculative fiction series is broader. So we get to publish all sorts of different things there. Here, uh, we have uh, certain parameters. So it needs to address the concerns of uh, young adults in the Philippine next context. So talking with publisher uh, Neil Garcia at that time, it was very, very exciting. Uh, it was uh, a guy named uh, Carl Joe Javier, a good friend of mine, who came up with the idea of actually collecting and creating a best of. And when I was invited at, to that conversation, I must confess it was an immediate yes. I didn't bother to think much, simply because it would give access to more people. Uh, the books would be, that book would be a fantastic uh, primer. We would get to select, in our opinion, the, 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 the exemplars of uh, spec fic for the past 10 years and get it out there. So uh, it's like reverse gatekeeping because they invited us and we were doing OK on, on our own. And it was around that time that we realized, because I'm, I'm a pretty fervent fighter uh, the term advocate is used but really uh, I I really push for it I, I really push for it uh, because as you know uh, there was a period in time in uh, Philippine letters when it was just realism uh, domestic realism and social realism and of course the literature of the political and, and all that and all of that is fine and important and integral to who we are and our culture but so is literature of the imagination which we have had since forever so it's just a matter of writing and creating and staking out new space for all the young writers who wanted to write in that mode to let their imagination run free so that is what Nikki and I were thinking when we agreed to to this uh, that it was a long road to get to there from the point where people didn't understand what the heck we were trying to do uh, I was at a writing workshop once and one of the panelists had to say for God's sake people let's talk to Nikki about her story and stop asking her what speculative fiction is oh. <laughs> and the panelists were like well we have to ask Nikki because Dean is belligerent <laughs> and now it seems as if everyone knows what it is and it's like you mentioned you know it's recognized enough that we have a best of that people are coming up with new iterations of it and it's funny when we use the term recognize because it's easily recognizable now but it was definitely an uphill climb for us uh, i would be on the defensive or the offensive from time to time i would I would be summoned by older writers to explain what the hell is this, what am I doing, and why, and why, and how does this help the nation? Ta -ta -chan! <laughs> so it was always within that kind of framework or paradigm. Then I had to explain to them its value and what it is and how important it is for, for us to have these kinds of stories. And of course, how we've had versions of these stories from a long time ago. Absolutely. And it's really interesting, too, to read the um, introduction to the first volume of Philippine speculative fiction, um, because you talk a lot about how um, just that it's difficult to find. You say you say fantasy is the kiss of death, right, yes. for mainstream Filipino publishers. And I, and, I, and I think that anthology was published in 2005. Yes. Um, and so I'm really interested in just sort of not just the um, like how speculative literature is recognized, but perhaps maybe you could talk a little bit about how the aesthetics are changing or or what writers, like what are you seeing in terms of like what people are interested in writing about or, or um, you know, subverting or, you know, um, I'm really curious about that. 
Sure. At the start, way back in 2005, the first few years, it was like the Wild West. It was like uh, people were given freedom to write whatever they wanted. And as long as they passed Nikki's editorial <laughs> process, uh, they could get published. And it was it became sort of like a, a competition because since it's print, we could only publish around 18 to 20 stories from the 200 or so that would come in. And uh, so we saw a lot of, of different types of stories uh, commenting on different things with different concerns. Uh, at the start, if we were to break it down into the three genres of fantasy, science fiction, and horror, Nikki, what would you say was more prevalent? We've always had a lot of fantasy. Uh, at the start, we had very little science fiction. We had very little science fiction, a lot of fantasy, and a smattering of horror. So maybe it's because it's the fantasist who was making the call for submissions. <laughs> but honestly, majority of them would, would, would be that. And uh, it would be the fantastic in terms of being grounded in, in a place, or uh, the fantastic as reimagined, uh, a reimagined Philippines. And I think it's largely because you know, if you had a Philippine upbringing, then it's part of your life. You know, the fantastic. It's like you know, your your mom doesn't want thirteen people to sit down at dinner, and that's normal, right? Yeah. So all the stu superstitions, all the folklore, plus all our lore and legends, and all these stories of the watas and encantos and and all that, and all the ghostly type stories of the white lady. All of those uh, eventually made it because they were the first things that people would think of given an opportunity to write fantasy. Science fiction was rarer, but also appeared. Uh, I remember in the first volume, uh, there's a story by a Dumaguete-based writer, Ian uh, Rosales Casoto, and this is the Pepe Report, which has to do with uh, Jose Rizal. So we, we've had good science fiction also that uh, thinks of what if scenarios moving forward and the philippines is smack dab center or or filipinos uh overseas workers uh, a lot of, of these things would eventually come uh at the start there was very little of what we would easily recognize as the political so in terms of social commentary our anthologies at the start were not the place for it because i think uh people we're reacting to the fact that you know what we can write about anything we want we don't want to write about that but it didn't mean that people were not concerned that the authors were not concerned in fact as nikki and i started to roll out the lit critters which was sort of like an open workshop for a lot of people we were approached by uh, a number of young writers uh, who only had one or two stories published or were working to be published and they were asking us how they could negotiate, how they feel about what's happening with the country with what they want to write. Because to them, sometimes it appeared antithetical uh, to, to create a fantasy story of, of hope and wonder and, and a sublime imagination. And then suddenly it's actually a subversion of, of, of Manila as we understand it. And I told them that eventually they will have to come to terms with who they are because the, every story is actually political. And you can say that you are writing speculative fiction and you can have your diwatas and cantos or Martians and space bears or whatever, but eventually who you are as an author, which is reflected by your upbringing and your circumstances, which are all political, will come to front, to fore. So uh, as the anthology progressed, we could see that there is more and more of, of these people became braver or actually we could say that they started the writing started to, to to mature without ever giving up that sense of wonder so there was still the delight that uh i was looking for from the very start uh the, the stories that would make my heart sing and and uh, tickle my my imagination what's interesting is we have a couple of couple editions of the anthology in the can because we are waiting we're trying to find the right publishing venue but you can see that the first of them has a lot of sense of despair and desperation and th this was put together when 
the Philippine president and the American president just came into power. So, and then the second book after that has a lot to do with coping, with the, the struggle to adjust to the new normal. So I find that fascinating. I'm waiting to see whether we end up with the five stages of anthology grief. <laughs> because it looks like we began with anger and we got to denial. <laughs> we'll see. Yes, and all the quarantine stories that will be submitted, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's gonna there's gonna be a short story titled Zoom Bombers or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I have, I mean I, I have a follow up question if 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 I can. So there there's I mean hearing hearing you both talk about um, the fact that speculative fiction and like fantasy can is is always overtly or inherently political, right? Or can be understood in a politicized kind of way. To me, you know, I'm I'm thinking specifically of like. The, the divide that often gets talked about um, within specifically like Filipinx American literature. Um, the, there's two people you point to and it's, it's, it's Carlos Bulasan and it's Jose Garcia Villa, right? Um, and so then the two approaches are a kind of like social realist um, mode with Bulasan that's, you know, overtly political. And then um, with, with, with Villa, it's, uh, you know, the sort of modernist kind of like apolitical only concerned with like arts for art's sake right um and, and the only reason why i'm thinking about this is because I, like just i was just teaching um in one of my classes the other day i was we just finished teaching uh, dog eaters and we were reading um, a critical article about dog eaters um, by an academic here in the states um, her name is rachel lee um, and she she mentioned the criticism of dog eaters by leonard casper uh, and uh, epifano san juan jr and, and their sort of critique of, of, you know, the kind of pastiche and the, the sort of, you know, crazy all over the place, pulling from different historical registers that Jessica Hagedorn is doing. And they're saying that, you know, like, if, if you're gonna write a political novel, you have to write in the realist mode, right? And, you know, that, that's kind of, I just, that, I, when I came across that line and I was talking to my students about it, it just felt so sad, you know? And I'm, and I'm thinking about your, your novel, Dean Salamanca, right? Like there's a way in which you know, I mean, there's there's just like crazy magical realist scenes in this novel. You know that you're just like, oh my god, like what, like what is going on? Like um, this is such a fantastical kind of like image, but at the same time too, it's I mean, it, it's dealing with a certain kind of, um, you know, in in my reading of it, like there's there's ways in which like you can figure like the the sort of rise of like the OFW kind of diaspora, the post war rise of OFW diaspora, in terms of thinking about. Um, you know, Filipino identity as being inherently transnational. There's also ways in which, like, you're you're um, dealing with the sort of haunted vestiges of, of martial law, but it's all done through this kind of fantastic mode. And I think it's an inherently political novel. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the kind of because I because I know that you know within within Philippine Anglophone letters at least, as well, there's this kind of like, you know. You're, you're like doing the social realist stuff of like the FC O'Neill Jose's and that's like political writing, like that's what you're doing. Um, or you're kind of doing this this other thing. And I'm thinking of something like Nick Joaquin, right? Like, I mean, like the, yes. the you yes. know, Nick, Nick Joaquin is writing political work that's crazy and wild and fantastic, right? Yes. And so yes. I'm wondering as like, maybe this is unfair to characterize you both as like the third camp that's doing something else, right? <laughs> But I was like wondering if you could say a little bit more about like how just just to keep going with this that 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 spec fic and that and that fantasy, um, you know, are always in some kind of way engaging with the present, the past, and to do that right, that's a certain kind of of, of political writing, and it might not be explicit in the sense that like we're not talking about like NPA guerrillas or something like that, right? But it's still doing something. Yes. So. There's a lot of truth to, to, to what you said. Uh, the, the writers now who use speculative, the speculative fiction mode to write are engaging whether they know it or not in a political way. Just by trying to write a science fiction story, for example, you need to situate yourself some when, somewhere else. Uh, the what if is based on the what is. So, you, you imagine a change or you imagine a sameness and you imagine what would be different or what would be retained. 
and inevitably you have characters and you situate them in in a place so that is your city that is your country and your values come out so you are using your imagination to make a political statement not an overt one but something that can be read or interpreted in a particular way uh, it may not be your intention to write a super political novel but how you position yourself as, as an author and what space your story occupies in the given current context of things will i'm telling you eventually show that you are political certainly a lot of the specific writers that that we know are allergic uh, because they want to keep it pure they they they, they want their their furry fantasies you know <laughs> you know but the young writers are always like crying when i tell them that writing is political you are political in that you know you're you write to express an opinion or to provoke thought i mean that that is the crux of it and i i just tell them you know you're really, what you're talking about can be as simple as love is good, hate is bad. But that is, that's like baseline simple politics, right? So I, I think if, if you're not, no, there's not an even and if you're not, you are engaged in the political just by the fact of living your life. And then let's take it a step further. There are authors who are very political already and they write about their political concerns using the mode of speculative fiction so they write about the plight of the ofws but but quote it in in a different way such that it becomes palatable because there we have readers who want to read sci-fi or horror or fantasy if you tell them this is a political story they'll go ah, i'd rather <laughs> watch netflix or whatever so these clever authors are able to write wonderfully so they are able to push their agenda their personal aesthetics of being able to tell a beautiful story in their own way their agenda of thought or politics being able to to craft uh, a story that would create a statement or provoke thought or at the very least a reaction and they are able to reach out to people who otherwise would not be interested in these things and of course there is uh, the way that speculative fiction uh, changes things so instead of something truly alien to someone or it's, it becomes alien because it is something you hear all the time and they have ceased to care so you give it a different veneer a different uh, perspective and then it becomes something incredible a different part of your your head is tickled and then your heart follows suit and then before you know it you begin to care which is the worst thing in the world so <laughs> <laughs> but an interesting thing with the philippine especially speculative fiction community we work with is a lot of people are they're not professional or academically trained writers that like we have a parkour teacher economists you know people from different walks of life so sometimes they will write something very brilliantly political and as an editor i will have to write back to them and say okay we're with you but are you a you know that this may lead to trouble or drama and if if you're if you're going with it then we're going with you but you know you we need to know that they know what they're getting into <laughs> Specfic allows us to be brave. It allows us to to couch our our thoughts in magic and be able to cast that spell so that other people will, will on one level just think it's just magic. But of course the secret of a magic trick is that there is a trick and there is something of substance there. So I I love it when we receive stories that have readings beyond the superficial, beyond the, 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 the courtesy fantasy or horror tropes or, or the scientific uh, uh, reinventions, right? Uh, things that are so startling. Later in our uh, series, we were uh, blessed to, to, to receive all sorts of stories like that. But we also give space for those that you could beat it and pound it with a rock. It has no metaphor. <laughs> it is just, it's just beautiful. And the, yeah, there's room for stories that are just lovely or just fun. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we also champion the stories that are just a delight to read. We have we always keep in mind when we release an anthology that this particular volume could be the first book that a new reader is going to pick up. So uh, that's why we make sure that there's a good mix of young and old, uh, new authors, uh, newly published authors, as well as established authors, as well as uh, a variety of stories, uh, gateway stories that are easy to, to digest and understand, as well as more challenging ones, right? Mm. It's really fun being married to your co-editor. You can be like, wake up, read this now! <laughs> That's great. I, and we have a couple of questions over chat and um, if you'd be willing to answer some of them. Um, someone asked, um, have you considered the option of print on demand for physical copies? Yes, actually uh, several of the anthologies, we, we, have, we have that uh, during, during that time. Um, I just didn't get into it as a regular thing because most of the time, I was printing. Uh, however, when we went digital, there were uh, requests to do just that. And I think we did it for a couple of volumes uh, upon request. But it was just a, a model that wasn't that interesting to me. But I will need to revisit that, of course. And then um, someone. What if there's no demand? <laughs> 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 um, Phil, uh, Ralph Ambrose, who is the assistant uh, fiction editor, he's on the call uh, for Starship Sofa um, and says, thanks, Dean, for letting our sister podcast, Farfetched Fables, run your story a number of years back. Um, he I remember that. Thank you so much. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> That's awesome. Look how um, scary. So, um, Ralph asks, I guess you could unmute yourself, Ralph, if you want to, um, but um, you you wrote in the chat, what's the relationship between short fiction and novel length markets? Oh, all right. Uh, here in the Philippines, short fiction does not sell, period. Uh, people are more willing to pay for a novel length piece, uh, a book. Uh, that's why short story collections as well as anthologies have very low sales. It's just the, the reality. Even with marketing push, uh, even if you put it in the big bookstore brands, even if you hold a launch, and even if you, <laughs> you did all of this, even if you, you push it digitally through Facebook or SoftMed or, or, or whatever, it's just the reality of things that the, the market for short fiction is so small. And in terms of publications, uh, right now there are only one or two magazines or publications that will publish short fiction in English. So it's not anything like uh, outside of our shores. Uh, in fact, we we submit abroad, uh, and and we hope to we always hope to get published in various magazines or online publications as well as in print anthologies. It's always outside. So uh, book sales have not been utterly fantastic, of course, uh, for the entire industry, but there is always hope. Although I don't know what's going to happen now because of COVID, because the entire book publishing schedule has, has been shot. There's no paper, there's no printing going on, and it's, it's deadly to deliver books and people can't get to the bookstore. So I, I really don't know. I have no idea. I will write about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, even our publishers are that they would prefer that we would write novels. But, you know, I I I don't have the focus to do. So. Nikki and I are always encouraged to write novels. Uh, I have a couple uh, unfinished because at a certain point in time, you know how it is. Things change. Things change in you, or the circumstances of life change, and then what you're writing suddenly is irrelevant, or or what. So I don't know. Uh, maybe sometime in the future. But we are always, whenever we meet one of the publishers, uh, Nikki and I are asked, "Where is your novel? Give us your novel. We will publish it." But there's nothing to give. How about a lot of short stories? Eh. <laughs> 
Our daughter is finishing her novel. Yeah, Sage is writing a novel, so good she's, for her. She's finishing her first novel or her second novel because she claims that she wrote Salamanca and dictated it to her father. <laughs> when she was four, was it four? She was two. <laughs> when she was two. <laughs> she has a very impressive vocabulary. <laughs> That's Thanks amazing. Thanks for continuing the fight for later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, someone, oh, I, someone asked a question about if you're writing specific novels. I think that answers that question. <laughs> um, but maybe you could talk about what you're writing, if it's a short story or any other forms, if you okay. are writing at all. <laughs> ah, all right. Uh, by by discipline, for the past decade or so, I have been focusing on short fiction. Uh, I like playing with form. So I like doing strange things and, and uh, tackling different things. So I actually have enough to release a fourth collection after the latest one, which was a field guide to... Tarakumi. No, no, a field guide to the roads of Manila. So uh, I think that will come out from Anvil pretty soon. Uh, in terms of uh, longer work, one of the novels I'm writing is actually a light novel. So that comes from the world of uh, manga and anime so via japan so this is a, a tip of the hat to the isekai fantasy wherein people are drawn and thrown into a fantasy world and we'll see what happens it's just that my vocabulary prevents me from writing light <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, i'm having to rewrite because i tend to when i am on my normal mode it's lyrical so I, I, I love words, I love language with, with a passion. So it's really discipline just, just to, to state things simpler. But it's, it, it's a challenge. Uh, the other novel that I'm writing to is actually a prequel to, to Salamanca. It's called Sin Vergüenza. So it is the, the, the story that happens before uh, the events of Salamanca. So hopefully, hopefully uh, in the next couple of years, it's not going to be like Salamanca, which, you know what, when I look back, it's miraculous. I wrote that in one month. <laughs> <laughs> I was dictated to you by yeah, a two-year-old. Dictated by my, my daughter. <laughs> I am supposed to be assembling my third collection, but really I'm crying about assembling my third collection. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have been talking about maybe collaborating on a nonfiction book about things people should talk about when before they get married yes oh. so we we from time to time fantasize about writing outside of speculative fiction <laughs> so the world of nonfiction looks so exciting and and so entrancing we think so like, you just say things that's cool yeah <laughs> with, 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 with truth right so you know and we can embellish it with spec fix sensibility so we're looking at actually doing that project uh non-fiction it would be like uh, advice to people before they get married and the other thing that Nikki and I are playing around with is uh, a history book. Hmm. So uh, a real history book of, 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 of the Philippines, but seen through a lens that is not quite academic and not quite, you know. Irreverent and fun. Yeah, so it would be irreverent and fun. And I think we need a bit of that right now. Mm -hmm. So we hope to do that soon. Mm -hmm. For your uh, nonfiction book about uh, advice for people who are not yet married, I, I was thinking, because I know you both do ballroom dancing, that would be cool to read about <laughs> as well. We haven't danced in forever. <laughs> we are entering our seventh week of quarantine here in the wow. enhanced community quarantine, also known as the big lockdown. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, uh, just a couple of days ago, it was extended over here in, in Manila until the end of April. So all our hopes were dashed of being able to go out, but it's, it's obviously important and necessary. And I think it's not even going to be quite enough, but we do what we can to stay sane, which is why we are so grateful that you gave us this opportunity because I'm talking to people who are not my relatives. <laughs> 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 you only think we love each other, daughter. 
Wait till that's when the world will get to see you before I run out of face wash and then shit will go down. <laughs> <laughs> she has been telling me that, you know, when I go out for essentials, those are essential. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree. <laughs> so I, I message her. I can fight for a dozen eggs or your face wash. You choose. Okay. <laughs> I think we'll, we have time, if that's okay, for one or two more questions. Is that okay with you? Sure. Um, so um, AJ Joven via Twitter asked, um, any advice for those of us starting to sit down to, to write for the first time, whether it's a novel or short story? Um, especially interested in hearing some of the practical stuff one should do after the manuscript is done. Okay. First of all, I want to tell you, young guns or, or, or young writers, you may feel the pressure right now because you are at home and you have seemingly all the time in the world. But you do not have to write right now if you don't want to. If you cannot, for whatever reason, this is a traumatic time for, for everyone. So please don't feel pressured or think that you have to produce. I've had it with this production model wherein the worth of a person is determined by what they create. Use this time, perhaps if you feel like that, to generate ideas. Come up with notions first. Uh, for some people, outlining a novel is a good step. For other people, it simply doesn't work that way. If I were you, I would create some time, even in this sort of endless time where in the days just blur into each other. It's important that you're able to create some time to sit down. Discipline yourself for a period of time and just write. You start with a small idea. Salamanca just started with a small idea. And you work from there. It doesn't have to be grand. It doesn't have to be the great Filipino novel that changes the world. It can be something that makes you smile or that makes you happy. So in terms of being practical, here's my advice. Determine if you're able to write at this moment. If you're not, do something else. Take care of yourself, your mental health, your emotional health, that's important. Or show compassion for others within your household. If you're able to write, sit down and discipline yourself. You have to conquer that blank screen. Uh, it is overwhelming. You asked about the novel, I'm telling you this, the novelistic space is terrifying. It's terrifying for anybody. It's terrifying for me and a lot of the novelists that I know when you start with the blank slate. So you partition your thoughts, you partition your, your strategy. Just write a few sentences or a paragraph you don't even need to be so disciplined as to have a page count or a word count but if it works for you good the important thing is this that you are engaged in the act of writing and remember please that writing is not just physically typing or scratching away with the pen a lot of writing happens here and, 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 and here so engage in the act of writing use this time if you are able to. If not, there will be some other time. Okay, Nikki, you have thoughts? If you've already written, because you were asking about, you know, what to do when the manuscript is done, I guess one of the most important things I need to say is there's a time when you need to stop writing and stop editing and submit it to someone. So don't be afraid of rejection because rejection is actually a good thing. It teaches you. You know, you know, if with the very good, very nice editors and publishers, they will explain what their problem is, what their issue is, why it doesn't work, and that can help you in the future. The last thing you want to do is get stuck working on one piece of work forever and trying to make it beautiful and perfect. You know, move on. You know, try to get things published. Get yourself out there. Move on. Um, I guess that's what I'm trying to say is that you shouldn't get stuck. Do not fall in love with your text. Yes. <laughs> do, do not think that because you spent blood, sweat, and tears on this thing that it is beautiful forever. Because it probably is not. And you need to move away from being me where I'm like all day I've been thinking about my story and I have put a comma. 
and this afternoon I have removed the comma. <laughs> and I'm looking over her shoulder and I'm going, oh my God. <laughs> so at a certain point in time, you just need to let go. There will never be a perfect manuscript. Believe me, there will never be a perfect draft. In fact, it's so important that you just get to the draft phase. So <laughs> Nikki is talking about what happens when you're done. I'm talking about just getting to the draft. You have to understand, young writers, that in itself is awesome. And you are awesome for getting to the first draft. So just do that. Get to that first. Yeah. And one of the things I learned from Dean is that, you know, you, you tend to leave classes about writing or you start your writing career with the idea that, you know, you're going to work on this perfect, perfect thing. And I learned from him that, you know, if you write four or five good things, one of them might be the perfect, perfect thing. So, you know, it's better to keep coming up with new things rather than obsessing on just one thing, which may not be nearly as good as you and your mom think it is. <laughs> so, so lastly, and this is just a, a personal preference, okay? So I am not trying to tell you that this is the only way to do it, but I would prefer it because it works for me, it may work for you, that you write a lot. So you, if you get stuck on a particular story, leave it for a while, step away, start a new project and, and, and get things out of your system. I would rather that you have a lot of things going on than just to be stuck on one thing for five years, okay? But in fairness, there are stories that really take a long time to percolate, but to each is own. Okay. Again, I'm not being prescriptive. Do not diss me. <laughs> oh, I'm going to be prescriptive. If you <laughs> are, what? What? No, if you are submitting things for publication, make a list or a file of what story you sent where, because you never want to send the same story to different people. You get in a lot of trouble. You might get blacklisted. So just keep track of what you're doing and where you're sending it. To. So nice that you think people's moms love their stories. My mom tears apart my story. <laughs> That's my job. That's life. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, okay, so I will uh, give you two questions and you can choose because people have such great questions, um, but I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, one question that I have is um, which stories are bringing you joy during this time? Um, so that's one question if you want to ask or answer that. And then um, David just asked over chat, what stands out to you when you're going through submissions? Right now, I'm reading Paul Kruger's Steel Crow Saga. He's a Philippine X writer. It is, I'm having so much fun with it. I'm already thinking about how I'm going to get the next couple of books. <laughs> it's great fun. It's like a pan-Asian speculative fiction novel. It's that I recommend it to everyone who hasn't read it. What brings me joy is speculative, right now, is speculative fiction, but not short stories and not a novel. I've gone back to one of my earliest loves, which is the comic book. So, Yay! yes, <laughs> so I, I have uh, been rereading my entire Sandman and Lucifer and Bone and uh, Starman and, and all of these things and Castle Waiting by Linda Medley. Yeah. that uh that just make me smile again it's really like meeting old friends and then on on rereading there are things you rediscover and sometimes the emotion that you know is coming you feel it again so it's like falling in love again and it really helps a lot for the second question we'll answer both uh, <laughs> what was it what stands out to us what what do we look for right it? Mm -hmm. nikki what do you look for i'm always looking for a hook so within the first three or four paragraphs, I want that thing that's going to make someone read that story because we do anthologies and I don't want your story to be skipped because it started out slow. So because it's a short story form with many, I'm looking for that immediate grab, boom, that sentence that's going to make you go, oh God, I need, I need to read the rest of it. We usually have a, a short reading period. And when we're dealing with manuscripts, in excess of 150, closer towards 200. The first couple of pages are very important. So we need to be hooked. We, we, we need to see something almost immediately. 
uh, in terms of it could be language, it could be the opening, it could be character, it could be uh, some sort of narrative trick that would allow us to mark that story for to read more and put it on one file as opposed to this is a no. And then once we have uh, sifted the story to a to read, that is when we read everything. When we have time though, we saunter back towards the notes because I feel very guilty. Uh, <laughs> decades already, but you know, I, I, I used to be that writer also with fervent hope. And perhaps I was, Nikki or I, perhaps were too, too rash, okay? And 98% of the time we were right, this is not good. <laughs> but the 2%, sometimes we find pressure that, that we missed because things got working by the third page. So in that case, we would uh, coordinate with the author and, and make suggestions and recommendations for something. Yeah, this is my letter that's like, dear so-and-so, congratulations, we love you, we love your story, now we're getting rid of these first two pages. <laughs> in terms of preference, it's already a bonus for me if your story is fantasy. So, uh, <laughs> Sorry, but uh, it's already something that, that I, I, I look forward to. I get so excited because uh, it's really, as I told you when we started, one of the big reasons why I wanted to read stories by uh, written by, by my countrymen. I, I actually look for science fiction because I, I struggle to write it, so I admire it so much. So it tends to be the thing that I'm hoping we get good ones. <laughs> In the recent years, horror has had an upsurge mm. also. Uh, because we're all horrified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Dean, for being here. This was so fantastic. It totally brightened my week. Um, and it was great to talk to you both. Um, yeah, this was great. And um, if folks who are still here, if you want to check out more of the Digital Sala um, programming, you can follow us again at the Digital Sala on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and we will be, um, with the permission of Nikki and Dean, maybe we can archive this talk um, and, and put it up for folks to watch if they want to. We'll try to edit like the Zoom bombing <laughs> sections. <laughs> or, or the time when we mysteriously vanish. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, we'll do our best um, to, to do that. But um, I think this is such a, a wonderful resource and, and both of you have so much um, to offer to, to writers. So um, thank you again. No, thank you for having us. Uh, this is such a pleasure because when you are under lockdown, things change and, and you start thinking about where will I get food and all of that. And suddenly all your literary whatever's become irrelevant. So for us, this is a, a welcome respite from the horror of real life. It is not an escape, but it is in fact now part so our horror now is uh, smoothed out by sheer fantasy of being able to <laughs> new faces and make new friends and being asked to talk about something that we both love and are passionate about. And for that, we thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.